Uh, what an honor here today to, to, to be chatting with uh, someone that I, I, I like to say that developed a friendship with, Dr. John Bookfar, uh, Vice Chair of, of Neurosurgery and a whole lot of other uh, important uh, credentials, uh, spends his life uh, treating the gravest uh, illness, and that is brain tumor disease, and including the most elusive uh, forms of brain tumor glioblastoma. And here we are, John, uh, it's uh, GBM Awareness Day, which, which uh, is, is perhaps uh, uh, not cause for celebration, but maybe it is, because uh, we're, we're the importance of bringing awareness to a disease that is under-researched, largely because it's underfunded, um, and, and patients every day are fighting for, for their lives. What's the significance of GBM Awareness Day to you, someone who spends his life by the bedside? Well, well, thank you, Matt, for that introduction. And it's a pleasure to be here to, uh, chatting with you about these important topics. I think one of the most important things about GBM Awareness Day is it, it inspires us to reflect and almost as if it's um, the, the day of the year where we look back on both our progress and our problems as it relates to a very challenging disease. And you and I both know that treating this disease does involve a lot of uh, positive and promising uh, treatments and interactions and success stories, but it's coupled with some disappointment and challenges and um, heartbreak. And so to me, like any other day of the year where we celebrate a holiday, it's a, it's a time for celebrating the lives both that we're fighting for and the lives that we've lost. And, um, you know, uh, it's a day of reflection for me and a day for us to organize and look forward and be optimistic and, and to see a bright future ahead. That's, that's fantastic. And I think you're right. Reflection is important and, and it's important uh, for all of us, but, you know, especially when, when you're fighting for something that is, is, you know, is, is simply saving lives and extending life. And, and I am, man, I, I, I have to say, I, when you told me a year ago when, when we met that, hey, uh, really excited about a new Netflix, uh, Netflix series that uh, uh, is, features me, that is you, and, and your partner, Dr. David Langer at Monix Hill, and our treatment of, of, uh, of brain tumor patients, uh, particularly GBM patients, um, I think it's gonna be a really good series. Uh, stay tuned for it. And, and you, you, you open the door to, to speak with the creators, the, the directors. And uh, I didn't know what to expect, but oh my gosh, uh, it, it's amazing in its, in its intensity. It's amazing in its truth. It's amazing in its, embrace of 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 uh, people that are that are that are that are looking to you and to the medical profession and to their loved ones to to to, to help them uh fight through this uh, it, it's an amazing series I, 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 just you mentioned reflection as you reflect and and think now that it's on the air and it's uh, it's uh millions of people are watching it what's your reaction just well, your reaction, you know, my, the reaction was sort of what my wife and kids' reaction was when I first <laughs> told them. They're like, yeah, dad, whatever. Um, we couldn't be more proud of the job that Yulari Films, uh, Adi and Ruthie, the, the oh production uh, yeah. uh, team, um, they really captured what we felt was really what was most inspiring, which was the, the pain and the promise, the heartbreak and the mm -hmm. love and really uncover uh, what we deal with every day. And as you know, the patient population, particularly for glioblastoma, uh, doesn't have a huge uh, source of uh, outreach uh, necessarily. Um, people are not looking under the rug of the treatments of glioblastoma on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, and so we're just grateful that it came together the way it did. Um, there's some beautiful stories told and some are painful and, and some are painful for the glioblastoma community to watch, but I think it's also a celebration of life and love and treatment and passion and both the healthcare providers, not just the doctors, but our nursing staff, our yeah. research staff, um, the administrative staff, 
Um, this is what we do every day. Um, we're fighting for lives. We're fighting for not just minutes, but hours, years, decades. Um, and we're making progress. It's slow. It's incremental. And what I hope the Netflix season uh, one does um, is really show what we've accomplished and show where we have to move in order to move the needle against this disease, glioblastoma. I think it, it's amazing. I, I was, uh, um, so Head for the Cure, we're, we're fortunate to be a partner with Lennox Hill and our, our New York event for Head for the Cure and broad and, and more broadly. And I've met, had the pleasure of, of, of meeting thousands of, of, of patients and caregivers and loved ones. And, and, and the hopefulness really resonates uh, with those people in an environment that is cause for hopelessness. And, and I think Lennox Hill captures that so well. And I, I uh, it's funny, you know, when, when actually my daughter, whose husband, my son-in-law is in med school at Tulane and he's uh, sorting out his, his, his next path. But uh, my daughter wrote me and said, oh my gosh, dad, you have to watch this amazing series uh, and actually, she talked to her mom first and said, I think dad knows Dr. Bookbar, who's a star. So, so she, was, uh, she was amazed by it. And, and I think that, that it is that, that hopefulness. And, and I, 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 I'm struck. And, and I, uh, I was so struck by, by you and, and you especially, uh, but your staff, that, you know, I, and I'm, I'm going to call them out because they, they're so beautiful. You know, Chris and, and his wife and family, who was featured in the, in the story, and, and Aggie, the NYPD police officer, who you had such empathy and touch for them. And, and I, you know, we talk a lot about, you know, joyfulness comes in moments. And, and it was so rich to see you bring those moments of joy that were driven by moments of hope. And I, 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 I how do you, you know, every day you deal with this lethal disease? and yet you bring such hopefulness and it was evident in, in the show. Can you speak a little bit about that, about what sort of motivates you and, and how you inspire the rest of your team to, to bring that? Forward? Well, I think, Matt, that's a really great topic and um, people have asked me that quite a bit. And I don't sugarcoat anything. I'm, I'm not here to, and I always tell a patient, as soon as they come under my care, I will give them the facts. Um, I will always look uh, at a glass half full um, and I won't sugarcoat something when I think the the treatments aren't working or there's a time where the treatments can be more harmful uh, than helpful. And, you know, I lost my dad to cancer 10 years ago. Um, I've been through this personally. And, and I would tell you that most of us obviously will have been through some medical illness uh, and yes. that helped drive the compassion and empathy, um, which I've always had. And the goal for me every day when I wake up is how can I provide meaningful moments uh, to patients battling uh, terminal illness and hopefully give them quality time with their loved ones or, or the, their spouses, their children, or themselves that's meaningful, that's independent, and that those are happy moments and we do that every day. And even though we may not cure every, any patient or every patient for that matter, um, we seek to cure them. Uh, but more importantly, we seek to control their disease in a meaningful way to give them meaningful, independent, productive life. Yeah. And that's our goal. And in glioblastoma, you know, we were saying in our brain tumor center, we strive for five years. That's our goal for every patient. And we make that clear to patients that we're, our job is to keep them alive and happy and independent with good quality of life until the next best thing comes along. And trust me, we trial a lot of great things. Some work, some don't. But our goal is let's get you five years and then we'll worry about the next five years with a new set of treatments. So we strive for five for every patient. And frankly, that's the part of the curve in glioblastoma that we're seeing improvements in. Yes, yes. And that's, how, and that's, 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 that's how we go for every patient, every patient. Yeah, that, that's, you know, and I, and I think that that is an important message today on GBM Awareness Day and one that you, you brought home so vividly in, in Lenox Hill as we followed Chris and, 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 and the good news, the good news, the good news, the bad news, or the, the, the unexpected news. Uh, but but his, uh, his embrace of that, and, I, and I, again, I, I think the, 
the way in which you deliver that. And having met many patients, I, I think that that is, that is so important, the honesty, the not sugarcoating, but yet maintaining hopefulness. You know, I like to say that, you know, a life without hope is a life without joy. And I, and I think that that is so evident in that the, the, the show was filled with joy. Yeah. I mean, it, it, it really was. And, and, and that, that was what was so sadness too, but yeah, it was the currency for the other, it's, it's been said. And, and so, but I love, you know, the five-year thing, it, it's, uh, uh, and, when you, and I know in your field, you have to measure progress in incremental uh, steps. Um, do you feel like during your career and where you go for that, that those incremental steps, more five-year survival, um, it, it is, is living with a glioblastoma or any brain tumor, is it better today generally than it was say 10 years ago? I mean, is, is your life better while you're managing this illness? Uh, we're about to publish, I think, an important paper that attacks that question. And with some of our clinical research uh, using blood-brain barrier disruption, we're seeing longer three, five-year survivors. And that data is becoming pretty clear. Even in other, uh, with other uh, clinical trials and other treatments for glioblastoma, and the reason is our surgery is becoming safer, much like your iPhone or Samsung phone has better navigation systems, so do my operative tools. And so I'm a safer surgeon than I was 10 years ago. Why? Because the technology is better. My irrigation devices are better. My bipolars are faster. I'm out of the operating room quicker and my patients' incisions are smaller. So that means that my patients have less neurological problems related to surgery. It also means I can do more surgery at recurrence. So I can do twice, three times, four times, five times. I, I love that, by the way, in, 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 in the show, Every time there was there was news, you came armed with, you know, with basically saying, "There's another arrow in the quiver." You know, I mean, you you you, you had an answer for, for every step, and that was uh, that was inspiring as well. And so I think, I think, I think we're going to see. I think we're going to see that trend improve, and some of that brings some challenges also, right? Because we do radiation based on data that's a couple of decades old when our patients were not living more than 12 months, right? So now you have patients who are living three and five years and the side effects of radiation that we didn't expect to see because patients weren't living more than 12 months, they can become an issue when your patients live uh, many years. And so that's becoming a challenge. Maybe we should be reducing radiation or staggering it, fractionating it in different ways. So I think we're going to see um, improvements in uh, understanding the blood-brain barrier. I think we're going to see continued improvements in surgical techniques, in understanding what's tumor, what's normal brain, how aggressive can you be with removing tumor. Um, so all of this uh, portends a bright outlook when it comes to treatments for glioblastoma. That's a... You know, I, I, the other great thing about, and, and a shout out again to Yolardi and Ruth Yanati, because they, they made this so approachable, you know, and, and uh, I don't know how many times you've been teased uh, uh, that it's not brain surgery, but in your life, it's brain surgery. <laughs> so, so, but you, I don't know what you say when you're a brain surgeon and you say, well, it's not, uh, but any, anyway, you, you made it feel so, uh, I guess uh, you released the anxiety. It wasn't so scary. And I think that that's one of the challenges as, as an advocate uh, to drive awareness and funding to, to support brain tumor disease and, and, and brain cancer. It scares people because it's so complex in their minds. And, and I think our job together, and I think you've made a, a great step forward with Lennox Hill is is to make it accessible, you know, and, and so that you can ask the right questions and feel uh, disarmed to ask them. Uh, right. um, and would you comment on, I mean, how important is that for patients to feel that, that, they, that, that they, 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 they're disarmed to ask the right questions? Well, I think um, it's very important. I mean, you can send an educational video of a computerized brain tumor being removed with, you know, animations and whatnot. And what I, I hope that the Netflix series shows 
is exactly what you said, that um, there are, um, there's a stepwise process um, as you fight this disease. And we hope that you, this um, makes people less uncomfortable or more comfortable to ask the right questions, talk about clinical trials. Remember, not nearly enough patients with glio glioblastoma enter clinical trials. Yeah. Oh, and we okay. know there's very, very, and this is a take home point that I want to hammer home. Please. Patients in clinical trials live longer, even if they get a placebo. Mm. So if you enroll in a clinical trial, this is across human disease, not just glioblastoma. Yes. Patients, if you look at all patients in clinical trials, irrespective of the disease they're being treated for, patients in clinical trials live longer than those who don't. Now, the placebo effect is real. So patients do have benefit from placebo. They do benefit from the oversight by being involved in a clinical trial. So they're, they're watched a little more closely. There's something called the Hawthorne effect, which is another effect of being watched. You tend to behave better uh, if you're being observed. So the takeaway point is in our community and your organization, Head for the Cure, is a terrific opportunity to spread awareness that it's scary to consider yourself being, quote, experimented on. But you, enrolling in a clinical trial improves your chances to live longer, irrespective of whether you get a treatment, experimental arm, or a placebo arm. That's, That's what, Dr. Bukhar, thank you. That, that is, we do get asked that question a lot. And it's one of those uh, misunderstood points about a clinical trial, and I and I think I was gonna I was gonna go there. So you, you know, you you run you know one of the one of the nation's largest hospitals in one of the you know the most densely populated parts of the world, um, where the you know access uh, uh, and to some degree is easier. So here you know I'm coming to you you know as your partner in Kansas City in the middle of the country. Um, and we do very much try to encourage patients to, to find their way, whether they live in you know, Western Kansas or, or remote Idaho, to, to find their way to an academic cancer or a center that, that, that has uh, academics that are studying this disease every day. That is important, isn't it? I mean, to get away from your and again, yeah. and look, I, I'm not, I, we are blessed to be in a metropolitan area that has access. My hospital's on the busiest subway line in the, in the United in States. The world, I think. Line. So the patients have access to the doorstep of my hospital. Sure. Thank goodness. However, with one of the silver linings of this pandemic that we're uh, struggling with is the boom of telehealth. So I am doing medical chart reviews now. I did five or seven of them yesterday where I can actually help um, a patient in, uh, I saw a patient in Virginia um, and basically help guide them. Now, there, we, we can't necessarily give medical advice in patients that we're not licensed in, but we can give uh, what's called a medical educational review and educate them about our clinical trials and some of that. And so that I would encourage any patient across the country to reach out, use the, the benefit of telemedicine, try to get yourself in the hands of providers that are willing to look at the case and uh, provide some educational opportunities about what's available out there. That, and of course, great. rely on foundations like Head for the Cure to help with that navigation process, because that navigation process can be uh, very challenging for patients, particularly That's, in rural areas. We have, we have encountered that and we're working to do just that. And I think, I, I wanna go back to your earlier point about clinical trials and how, and, and you, you, I, my takeaway is pretty simple to that. And there's a lot of noise in our world right now about, uh, uh, about similar subjects, but data matters and science matters. And, yeah. and that's and and encouraging people to be attentive to uh, to the data and the science and and clinical trials are the path uh, that ultimately will conquer this disease and other other uh, other complicated diseases. Correct? That yeah. One one thing I want to just bring to your attention: you talked about data and science. Don't forget the word conflict. So mm -hmm. there is conflict in every provider. Mm -hmm. 
And so I want every patient to know from the get-go that I get paid zero for any trial I'm involved in. And so the first question that should come out of a patient's sure. mouth is, this sounds like a great idea. Are you invested in any oh. way financially in this company? Are you a shareholder, inventor, CEO, sit on the scientific advisory board? What is your relationship to this new drug, oh biotech? And you'd be surprised at the answers. Um, doctors are supposed to disclose, disclose that information from the get-go. I can tell you, not often done. That's a, not, that is any, not malintent, but yeah. it, it kind of falls by the wayside. Oh, I'm, I'm using this probe in the operating room uh, that can distinguish uh, normal tissue. Oh, by the way, I'm the inventor and I owe all the royalty and income. Uh, so don't be afraid advice. to ask those questions. They're hard I questions. Think, I think, you know, efficacy matters, uh, especially yeah. in, in uh, medical field. So that, that is, that is great advice. You know, you mentioned, uh, you know, awareness and, and, and we feel our, our role at Head for the Cure, we, uh, and we've been challenged a bit, of course, by, by, uh, by the pandemic. Uh, our platform is we operate uh, uh, 30, 35 Ks, uh, runs and walks, talk about cars. Uh, I think uh, you, know, you, you set the pace last year at Randall's Island. So, <laughs> so uh, and, and you could see it on Monic Cell. You know, my wife teased me that and said, look at these guys. I mean, they're the busiest people around. And they managed to get up and work out every morning. So don't tell me you're not working. So <laughs> that was another. But, uh, but we've had to move our events to virtual events. And, and uh, while it's not ideal, uh, we're, we're, we're thrilled with how people have embraced the fact that it's a fundraising platform. You can still get off the couch. You can go to your treadmill, go around the block, uh, go to the park. And so we're holding all of our events. We're doing so virtually. And, and our New York event to benefit Lenox Hill is on schedule for October 17th, Saturday. Uh, so supporting Dr. Book, Book Bar and Tamika and the team at, at, at Lenox Hill. So, so look for that. Uh, that's the, the uh, gratuitous plug there to, 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 to sign Thank up you. and register and support support head for the cure to support Dr. Bookbar's efforts at, at, at Lenox Hill. And, and we're going to continue to serve as that navigator. And, and uh, that's why we're so excited that, that you know, uh, everything that matters that ultimately has good outcomes have points of inflection. And, and uh, I think Lenox Hill, the Netflix, docuseries is an inflection point. I really do. It, 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 it's, uh, uh, there have been a number in, in, in the, the time that I've been uh, uh, managing to, to move forward with Jenna and team at, at Head for the Cure, but this one is big because it, 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 millions of people have access to it. Uh, clearly, Netflix is behind it. And, and I know if you haven't seen it out there, folks, you, you, you have to tune in. It's, it's, it's if you're looking for mindless entertainment, it is highly entertaining, but it's entertaining in a, in a very moving way, in a very authentic way. So, so I, I, I love documentaries, but this one has a, a, a dramatic effect that is, uh, that is really unique. You know? So it's, it's a, it's, I would say it's more of a docudrama. I don't know if Netflix would, 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 you, would you agree with that? I mean, it's a... Uh, it's, uh, I, I... <laughs> I think it's surprisingly dramatic, you know, for people. And I like how you summarized it where, um, look, there's no acting, there's no script. Um, and they filmed, you know, 450 hours worth of filming. So uh, what you're seeing is eight hours of uh, selected uh, footage. And I can tell you the rest of, and I don't want to do the math, uh, you know, 444 hours of, of um, uh, footage, 42. Um, is just as dramatic and there are great stories hidden in those archives and um you know we're just thrilled that the glioblastoma community has this documented and as something that they can understand digest be proud of uh hopefully provide hope and promise and and to show that there are doctors out there that really care about their well-being not just that are you know um in the docu series, but there are a host of doctors and nurse practitioners and PAs and administrators that really care and want to do what's uh, best for each and every patient and family. And so, 
hopefully there'll be a season two. We don't know that yet. That's up to Netflix and uh, we can, can continue to build on There wouldn't be. It, it. It's so good. I have to, you know, my, my, there were a lot of favorite moments in the, in, in, in the show, but the one that I think about often was, uh, it, I was touched by it when, when, when you, before, before surgery, uh, you, you and your team and team of 10 or whatever, your entire team held hands and, 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 and made a, a, the, the moment of silence and the moment of reflection and the moment of positivity, let's do good for Chris or for this patient. It was just so touching. I'll, I'll, uh, I'll never forget it. And, and, I, I, and I know that I, my guess is, is that's, that's a matter of course for you, right? You do that probably before every surgery. Yeah, and I can't, I can't actually remember how I came up with the idea to have this, I call it a mindful moment right before surgery. It must have been um, obviously within 10 years ago. And I read a book called Full Catastrophe Living by John Kabat-Zinn, which I would recommend for anybody. Yep, we'll put it on the and it actually, uh, for the glioblastoma community in particular, I think it's a terrific book. Again, it's called Full Catastrophe Living. By John Kabat-Zinn, and he was the—he's basically the great, the great grandfather of mindfulness training, and it came out of the University of Massachusetts uh, Stress and Cancer Clinic, hmm. and so it's really the Bible, if you will, of mindfulness. And once I read that book, I my life changed, and I got it for every single person in my office: Sharice, Tamika, David Langer, my wife. And I basically, I've given it to kids, children, patients. Um, it is a life altering book and it opened my mind to mindfulness training. And from that moment, we started adding the mindful moment to our surgical timeout and it's been terrific. And everyone's different. Everyone, everyone uses these techniques differently, but I would encourage every patient to take a look at this book, Full Catastrophe Living. Full catastrophe is, is life, by the way. That's life is considered the full catastrophe. So how do you? I like the you, I like the metaphor that it suggests. So that that's yeah. but it is that the mindfulness piece is 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 so and obviously attitude, positivity, energy, it all matters uh, for everyone, for the patient, for the caregivers, the loved ones, and and we're finding so much of of our work connects to that shared decision maker, the, the, often the quarterback of, of, of the relationship with the medical team is the caregiver, uh, if that's the right term for it. You know, yeah. a wife, a brother, a sister, a, and, and I played that role with my brother. I mean, he yeah. had a, a glioblastoma, and, and it was actually you know, one of the greatest rewards of my life. I mean, we're here today because I, you know, the promise I made to him that I'd, I'd, uh, I'd bring that forward. So. Uh, and I think mindfulness is the center, but I, but I love those those simple moments, and it's the simple moments that connect us to the big moments, and and that's uh, that what better, what what more, you know, a simple moment that's connected to the biggest moment possible, you know, an eight-hour uh, craniotomy and a, to remove uh, malignant brain tumor. So it, it just was so 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 beautiful. Uh, well, Dr. Bookvar, I I I I feel like we could talk all day. I'm I'm. I, I want to thank you again for your, for the work you do, uh, for your empathy, for your your, uh, just uh, your accessibility uh, for all you do, and 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 I uh, I'm proud to have 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 met you, and I'm I'm proud to call you a friend ahead for the cure and personally, and and uh, we're going to do all we can together. Uh, uh, this is a long journey, and uh, we you know it's a step step by step journey, but. But, and, and man, uh, you gotta watch Lennox Hill. And, and it is the best way in a very simple, simple way to support this work we're doing to help people fighting GBM. And, and so today, the celebration, you know, thanks to the people in Washington uh, the, the, who crossed the aisle and, and, and uh, made a crop proclamation that GBM awareness is a, is a, is a Senate approved uh, proclamation. Um, thanks to people like John McCain and, and Ted Kennedy who passed of, of, uh, of GBM and their legacies are moving forward uh, through their families. And, and uh, thanks to our colleagues at National Brain Tumor Society and uh, especially you and, 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 and your colleagues 
in the OR and, and neuro-oncologists looking at microscopes, looking at tissue, sharing tissue, finding the right protocols to help people. And we're gonna do what we can to help you help those patients, John. So thank well, you. Well, thank you. And Jenna, thank you and Matt and the Head for the Cure organization. You're an incredible partner and we look forward to um, lots of uh, good stories ahead and lots of positive experiences and lots of breakthroughs in uh, trying to battle glioblastoma. Hey John, could we could we I'm gonna I'm gonna ask you to lead could could we end with a mindful moment for the entire sure. GM community today? Of course. And may I ask you to to lead? Sure. Yeah. So our mindful moment is a time for us to basically um, be in the moment. That's where the term comes from. Be present. And a lot of that actually comes back to your breathing, right? I always say uh, to my kids, really the only thing you have with you all the time is your breath. You may not have your cell phone, you may not have your wallet, but you always have your breath. And so in any moment of anxiety or stress, whether you're suffering from insomnia, undergoing a treatment, uh, failing a math exam, or uh, stressing about an aneurysm rupturing in the table, come back to your breathing. So that's what I'd like to do with you, Matt and Jenna, now. What we'll do is we'll close our eyes, and your thoughts will come into your head, and it's okay to let them go. And part of that mindfulness training is what I call see it and let it go. So all of a sudden, you have a thought about your next mortgage payment. Just see it and let it go and come back to your breathing. And we try to do what's called a four, seven, eight breath, which is four seconds on the inhale through the nostril, seven seconds hold at the top, and eight seconds of exhale through the mouth. And let me tell you guys, it's not easy to do, but we'll mm. try to do it together. So we'll do a four second inhale, hold it at the top for seven. Exhale through the mouth for eight. And on your own time, do that two more times. Enjoy the sounds around you. Come back to your breathing. One last time. So if you've done that, you've just practiced mindfulness. Now, awesome. you do that for five more minutes a day, you do that for 10 minutes a day, you do that 45 minutes a day, guess what happens in your brain, Matt? Your amygdala, which is the anxiety center, it is known that that simple move whether you do it two minutes, five minutes, 10 minutes, 45 minutes, will actually quiet down. And so we know that anxiety revolves around activation of your amygdala and actually mindfulness training. This has been studied obviously in, in Western medicine, but dates back for centuries that if you cool your amygdala, you have less anxiety. And so that's what mindfulness training is. So these are just little tricks to help us uh, reduce our stress. John? Thank you, man. Thanks for, uh, thanks for having me, Matt. Thanks for